Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Retail Cyber Threat Summit, Insights and Strategies from Ex Industry Experts. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Coordinator here at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of this presentation today. Before we start, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. First, make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. So be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's webcast is presented using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge it. If you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It is the question mark icon on your console and covers common technical issues. If you have a question for our presenters, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. Time permitting, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Lastly, I will be sending out a link to the on-demand version of this webcast and a link to the slides. Also, you may earn a CPE credit for attending today. So now let's get on with the presentation. We have five speakers today full of great information for you. We have Sam Heine, Product Solutions Director for NetOp, Randall Cox, Chief Scientist and Co-Founder at RippleShot, Scott Waddle, Chief Technology Officer at iOvation, Jeremy Henley, Director of Breach Services at ID Experts, and Ken Weston, Security Analyst and, at Tripwire, Inc. If you'd like to read their full bios, click on the bio widget at the bottom of your console. So now, without further delay, let's get on with the presentation. Ken Weston will start us off. Take it away, Ken. Sorry about that. Uh, so, you know, over the uh, past few years, year, we've seen a number of retailers get hit hard by criminal syndicates compromising their networks and installing advanced malware on point-of-sale systems and other techniques. Um, the repeatedly successful attacks on retailers has led to an unprecedented number of credit cards being compromised, leading to massive losses for retailers, banks, and card issuers, as well as loss of trust from consumers. However, even as these retail breaches make the headlines, more retailers continue to be hit. Are retailers not learning from um, others' mistakes, or are attackers simply finding new ways into these networks? The criminal syndicates have an entire underground market at their disposal that takes advantage of inherent weaknesses not only in retail payment systems, but in our credit card payment systems as a whole. These weaknesses are, are being exploited, and these syndicates are generating a great deal of income as a result pretty much operating with impunity in Eastern Europe and Russia and working with lower level actors in the US. The entire underground economy that runs off stolen credit card data is thriving. So the problem has been so bad that even the US CERT has issued several advisories to retailers regarding what, what to watch out for. Um, and wanting to understand the problem and solutions, I've been involved in conversations with many researchers and companies and have found that it's not a single solution to these breaches, that, and it really requires organizations to look at the breaches from a more holistic perspective. I thought it would be good to bring some of these companies together to discuss the various technologies and methods for preventing, detecting, and remediating these breaches throughout the entire breach lifecycle. Uh, my cybercrime adventures today um, include experts from NetOp, RippleShot, iOvation, and ID Experts. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Sam Hani from NetOp to discuss uh, how to secure remote access um, to retail networks as well as systems. Uh, take it away, Sam. Thank you, Ken, and um, my thanks for being included in the panel. Um, let me start off by letting everyone on the, um, on the call know a little bit about NetOp, give you some basic company information, and then we'll talk about um, some of the threats and mitigation strategies. NetUp is a, um, a Danish company, and we've been in business for a little over 30 years. We have offices around the world. And we work with a, um, a fair number of large enterprises. And as you can see on the slide, roughly half the Fortune 100 here in the US, in Europe, um, close to 60% of Financial Times, top 100. 
And when you get deeper into those customer lists, it's um, scalability and security that are really kind of the hallmarks of what, of what NetApp offers. And because we've been working with literally 12,000 customers, um, you know, nearly 9 million end users, and we estimate something in the range of 100 million connections a day, we are involved in a wide variety of types of organizations, types of enterprises, and are included as a vendor in the security architecture and the conversation that these companies are having. And it's some of that information that I'm hoping to share with you today. So when we look at this, this topic, you know, the cyber threats, identifying the vectors of attack and trying to mitigate those attacks is, is really what we at NetOp are, are trying to, to, to bring information about and, and to focus on. Um, and as remote control and remote access uh, vendors and kind of experts, that tends to color our view of this. Um, but regardless of who you are, and I think all of the panelists on this call will agree, that one of the primary threats that we all face, if not the primary threat, is just our users. You know, people are people. And whether you are looking at user error as just you know, someone who made a mistake, or the types of systems that are so complex and hard to use that our capabilities as people have been outstripped, um, we have to be aware of that. You know, security is inconvenient, I mean, by its definition. So it's, it's a lot easier for me to just walk out of my house than it is to stop, get a key out, lock the door, and walk away. But every time we try to put security in place, we are inconveniencing our users, and there's a natural tendency to fight against that. Our systems have also become so complex that that complexity in and of itself has become a vulnerability. And you'll hear from some of the other panelists on this call some of the problems that that creates. But as we increase complexity in our networks, in our systems, in our products, we also increase the vulnerability of those same systems and our entire enterprises. That's not because users are making mistakes. It's just because things are getting so hard for us to handle. The next big threat vector, though, is not related to complexity or you know, user error, but it's, it's really discoverability. And there's a, um, a company out there, and I wish my marketing department had come up with this slogan, but they say, you can't hack what you can't see. And I, I like that concept. Um, and for years and years, people have used this m methodology of security through obscurity. If we can just hide it, um, then, then they're not going to be able to find it. Um, well, that, that's really gone away. I mean, increasingly things are more and more and more discoverable. Um, you've got the Shodan search engine. You've got Google. You are looking out at networks, and I guarantee that right now you yourself and your network, it's being scanned. So the proliferation of devices and technology that allow for things to be found has made our job as security experts, our job as um, good stewards of these systems um, even harder. Um, and it forces us to rely on methods to, again, try to find ways to hide, to obfuscate, to make sure that the devices and the users that we are working with are not publicly accessible, cannot be discovered. You know, the next thread is one that's um, obviously kind of the, the, the real source of, of all of this for NetApp, and that is remote access. NetApp is a, a company that focuses on remote access and remote control techniques technologies. And for years the industry has known that remote access tools have been a threat vector, but it was really brought to light back in 2012 with um, the Verizon data breach study. And they had estimated at that point that 88% of all of the breaches that they were analyzing were happening as a direct result or through the primary attack vector of remote access tools. And when you get down into the details of that report, they were saying that compromised remote access tools were used in something like 95% of all of those breach events. Now, this information has changed in the last couple of years, but it is still a huge threat vector. So the remote access points that you create in your network are something that have to be addressed if you want to maintain a secure network. And how do you do that? Well, the mitigation strategies that we recommend are first, and there are a lot of these, um, but I think before I get into those mitigation strategies, let me first say that there is no silver bullet. So 
I, you know, I was I was excited when Tripwire called and said, "Hey, we we're thinking about you know including you know some other players in this because we recognize, and I want everyone on this call to recognize that there's no one solu single solution, as Ken mentioned at the beginning of this call. There's no one way to protect yourself with a single solution, and you have to have a mentality of creating layer upon layer of defenses to make sure that you're safe and. What we recommend as a, a primary, one of the first things to do is to segment your network. And the days of having a, you know, an inside the network and outside the network in a DMZ, um, those are gone. You know, so you really need to have multiple segments, multiple zones that you are analyzing very carefully. And, and within those zones, you need to make sure that some of those kind of secure zones that you're creating, those secure network segments, um, aren't accessible to other areas. And, that, and that's really the definition of what segmentation is. It's not just about putting things onto a different switch or isolating them in a different network. It's looking at the transition points, and it's really being um, cognizant of how people are moving between those two areas. And I, I think segmentation in this concept is only as effective as how um, how much you are looking at it. So it's not enough to just segment your network, but you also have to scan those network segments regularly to ensure that you don't have rogue connections and to ensure that your segmentation has been effective. And again, some, some of the players on this call will, will get into this a little bit more, but if I'm not regularly looking to make sure that I don't have open RDP connections, I, I can go in and try and shut them all down and to make it very defined, but if I then don't regularly scan my internal network as well as the external network facing, um, then I'm really not going to be confident as a security professional to know that a bad actor or, or again, one of my users just mistakenly opened up a port or opened up some um, access to you know, mission critical information on a device within my network. Once you get through some of the, the segmentation, the next step is, is really just the basics, right? And it is encrypt your data. And encryption has become um, easier and easier. The, the ways to do this are no longer incredibly complex, and NetApp recommends that you just encrypt everything. And when you look at PCI DSS requirements and when you look at other security protocols, maintaining high levels of encryption is important. But this can't be just a, uh, uh, an encrypt it and forget it sort of strategy that you walk away from. Because as we've seen with some of the SSL3 and the, the Poodle exploits, you have to manage and you have to be looking at even the encryption algorithms, and you've got to maintain a very proactive stance even with this. But suffice it to say, if you have started using end-to-end -end encryption inside and outside of your network for all of those remote access sessions, you're going to be ahead of the game, and you're going to be more secure than if you had not. And it, it's really, again, this strategy that we recommend, that you do lots of small steps. You know, security in and of itself, being secure isn't hard to do. It's this step is easy. This next step is easy. You know, you, you take lots of small steps and lots of layers of defense. It's the complexity of the environment, and it's the compilation of all of those steps that make this so difficult for companies. But focus on some of the keys. Segment your network, make sure that you're end-to-end -end encrypting um, your data streams, and you're going to um, go pretty far. The next mitigation strategy that we would recommend here um, is also, again, uh, kind of one of the roots of a lot of the problems we see today. Um, Good encrypted, you know, tools that offer good encryption are increasingly available at very low cost. Um, and, you know, segmenting your network, there's good documentation, and there's a lot of knowledgeable network administrators out there who, who already are doing this. But when we look at remote access tools specifically, and remember, 88%, as much as 88% um, of hackers were targeting these tools, you know, a big, big problem here was just poor identity validation and weak authentication. So it's managing how users are accessing systems, and then, critically, once they access those systems, what are the permissions that those users have? And so when, when you start looking at your, your security architecture, it's not enough to make sure that you are restricting access through an encrypted channel. channel excuse me. Um, you can give you know, someone a, a great VPN service, lots of encryption. You know that you're managing that this is the right person. But if that person now has access to all sorts of devices that they shouldn't, has access on those devices to things that they shouldn't do, 
again, you're left with another security flaw. So managing your users is about managing their access and also managing the permissions that they have. And doing this requires that you select tools that offer a lot of granularity. Um, so just giving all your users that have access to this device all the permissions they need, kind of standard admin access, is going to lead you down a bad path. So look for tools um, that provide really granular approaches to managing user access and user permissions. But it's also important to avoid complexity when you can. And in most large organizations, and shoot, even in a lot of small to medium businesses, you will find three, four, five, six different remote access tools. You're using uh, remote desktop, Microsoft RDP. They've got VNC. Um, they've got some older legacy equipment where they may have Telnet access that they're still using. Um, you've got vendors that are now requesting access to um, a wide variety of different types of devices. Some of those, they need proprietary access with gateways that they are providing. Pretty soon, I've got four, five, six different tools that are providing access into my network segments. And each of those network segments, and, and I don't care if it's your point of sale system or your building management systems, you need to be able to centrally govern and manage who those users are. And if you can consolidate your tools down, if you can try to eliminate the variety so that you can become an expert in that one area, you are going to go, again, you're going to go very far in making sure that you have a good understanding of who's coming into the network, what they're doing, what they're able to do, and then finally, logging what they do and documenting that activity. And this documentation I, I put at the end because documenting your activity is, is really not going to prevent the breach, but it is going to help you in all of the steps that are required if a breach happens to mitigate that response, to terminate it as soon as possible, and then in terms of your notification process. And NetOp offers a tool that logs over 100 different events, and, and we are increasing what we are logging all the time. And the reason that we provide that level of, um, of logging and auditability, if you will, is because this type of documentation is going to be useful to a lot of different stakeholders across the board. And having access to just the basics of who got into this system, how often did they get into that system, what did they do when they were there, some of these just little points that you won't find in off-the-shelf remote access tools will be critical for your security architects and for your network administrators if there is ever, and, and we should probably say when, there is a security response that you, that you need to have. So good documentation is, again, it's one of those critical foundational things that you need to have. And before I turn this back over, I, I just want to do a quick recap so that everyone is clear, you know, the, the idea that we want to really encourage folks in is, is not that you need to spend tons of money, is not that you need to have a huge change in mindset that, you know, creates um, this cybersecurity infrastructure within your organization. Because although those things are necessary, it's, it's how, how do you do that? You know, how do you eat an elephant? Well, the answer is one step at a time. And through creating good processes and following best practices that help you as an organization take care of the basics, and then to eliminate unneeded and unnecessary complexity so that you can secure those you know, obvious threat vectors. And by segmenting your network, by making sure you're doing frequent network scanning to confirm that segmentation, by encrypting your data, and then by really aggressively managing your users. And, and that is through good identity validation and through strong authentication into the, the network segments that require it, um, you're going to you're gonna be much, much more secure than if you aren't doing those things today. And finally, document all of that activity. Make sure you have good logging in place so that as you start working with the other tools from some of these other vendors that you're about to hear from, you've got a great baseline, you're providing good information, and you are eliminating some of those really big open doors into your organization. You shut some of those doors down, and I guarantee that your organization will avoid a lot of the hassles that some of these companies that Ken uh, put up on the slide earlier have gone through. And with that, I turn it back over to you, Ken. 
Thanks, Sam. Really appreciate it. Really good, uh, good stuff there. Um, so, you know, one thing I was like, I've, I've worked a little bit with uh, NetOp, um, you know, talked a lot about their technology. I was really interested um, in particular is the, you know, the security component of the remote access. Um, you know, when I actually saw one of the advisories from the U.S. CERT where um, they were actually talking about remote, remote desktop, I was thinking, well, geez, if they're complying with PCI, then, um, you know, that shouldn't be the case. Um, but actually, I, I did a quick scan where I actually um, used a scanning tool, um, and within 10 seconds, uh, just doing random search on the Internet, I found over 1,200 system uh, systems with open RDP ports. Um, and what I also found is a lot of retailers will actually utilize, um, you know, consumer-grade remote desktop tools um, for their point-of-sale systems. Um, and we've actually seen a few breaches that were the result of that. Um, even payment uh, providers um, were actually, uh, you know, logging into remote systems for their customers using those tools. Um, and what that tells me is a lot of organizations are doing their sort of quarterly scans or, you know, just doing enough to, to get their checkbox on compliance, but not really using that as, um, you know, guidance for actually securing their network. Um, and that's a real big problem that we have, um, particularly in retail. Um, so in addition, um, you know, if there are RDP um, uh, ports open, um, there's a number of tools that are available that uh, really allow um, someone with malicious intent to gain access very quickly um, to those, uh, those systems. Um, a lot of times even those systems will still have default passwords uh, configured, um, and that's uh, just asking to be attacked. Um, there's even, um, if you look on the underground, there's also um, RDP passwords and systems that are um, actually being sold. So uh, someone may not compromise those right away. They may compromise those uh, accounts and then sell them in bulk um, to, um, to um, malicious users in underground markets. Um, and, you know, RDP isn't, the remote desktop isn't the only attack vector that we've seen. Um, you know, if, if uh, these attackers, they're, they're doing their research, they're spending um, almost months actually doing the research on their targets. Um, you know, they'll do the reconnaissance, um, they'll gather everything they can about their, um, about their uh, target, as well as their trusted business partners, like we saw with Target. Um, so they'll rely on remote desktop, they'll re uh, rely on phishing, which is still a very successful attack vector. Um, they'll go through and target a, a business partner, um, like we saw with Target, where it was through their HVAC vendor, they were able to gain access to the network um, through the accounting system. Um, and then, of course, we have good old exploits, which um, were, um, you know, it's a continuous um, battle we have to fight. But once the organizations actually get inside, then they're, um, it gets a lot easier, actually. Uh, we're finding that a lot of times organizations, um, they're not um, securing their internal network as well as they should. They think, hey, we've secured the perimeter, we're good to go. Um, but really, nowadays, um, in today's threat landscape, you need to plan on your network being compromised. Um, and, and what does the attacker see once they get inside? Um, with a lot of the retail breaches we've seen is that the hackers get in, um, they're then easily um, uh, able to uh, access critical assets, uh, just move laterally within the network. Um, in cases like Target, um, they're able to compromise patch servers, um, and then what they're able to do is then quickly deploy um, their point-of-sale malware to point-of-sale systems. Once that takes place, um, they're able to then exfiltrate and aggregate all those credit card information, all the credit card data, um, and then, of course, exfiltrate that out to a drop site. Um, and what's happening with retailers right now is that this is all happening without any sort of detection. Um, and so it really uh, raises the question is, what sort of tools do these organizations have, um, both on the prevention side as well as on the detection side, to help uh, remediate these particular attacks? And w one thing I like to look at is there's the, was once referred to as the SANS 20 security controls, now it's the CSC security controls. Um, and if you actually look at the first four, they have an NSA rank of, of very high. Um, you can actually get um, a lot of uh, leverage simply by following these four. Um, on the prevention side. So, you know, simple inventory of your assets, um, uh, both software as well as hardware, um, is security configuration of your servers, ensuring that you actually have those systems hardened, um, and then, of course, vulnerability assessment and remediation. And when I talk about vulnerability management, I'm not talking about quarterly scans. I'm talking about continuous uh, monitoring of vulnerabilities. Um, almost uh, daily, we're seeing new vulnerabilities that are being uh, put out into the market. Um, on average, it takes about one week uh, once a vulnerability is made public for an exploit to start being seen in the wild. Um, so organizations really need to start taking that seriously and have a continuous uh, vulnerability management process in place. 
And I should mention too that uh, with uh, Tripwire, we actually provide a, a free tool. Um, it's uh, called SecureScan, uh, and it's available to run internal scans of your network for up to 100 IPs. So um, if you're a small organization or a department or even at your home network um, and you want to run those scans, um, you can uh, do that, and it's just at tripwire.com slash SecureScan. Uh, we'll provide a link um, as well after the webcast. So if we look at sort of the, you know, the 30,000 foot view of these attacks, you know, how can we actually prevent these? So on step one, if we actually do um, system hardening, you know, harden our configurations of things that are, you know, facing um, outside the internet, um, you know, we want to assess any sort of perimeter vulnerabilities and we need to do that continuously. We then need to identify, prioritize, and then remediate those vulnerabilities. Not all vulnerabilities are created equal. Um, if there is an exploit that's out there or if it's a highly critical asset, um, you're going to want to um, you know, patch those systems faster than, than others. Um, and then, of course, we want to continuously monitor for file changes and also monitor for um, indicators of compromise. So if we actually look at um, you know, point of sale and payment gateways in particular, there's a lot of vulnerabilities um, within the system. So even if um, you're using a commercial product vendor or a, uh, you know, any sort of point of sale system out there, there's still going to be inherent vulnerabilities. There are still places um, where credit card information is not being encrypted. And attackers are well aware of this. Um, if anything, they're probably experts in PCI more so than uh, some of the folks that they're attacking. Um, they know where PCI is weak. They know where the, um, they can find the, the credit card data. And this is just a few examples of where we can actually find some of that information. So uh, when we look at point of sale malware, there's um, a lot of uh, different versions that are out there. Um, Black POS is one that's very common. That's what we actually saw that hit um, Home Depot. We saw it hit Target. Um, it's essentially an open source tool because the source code was released on the underground. Um, so a lot of the criminal syndicates actually have access to this. And what we're finding is that they're actually customizing that code for um, the various targets um, as they learn more about the organization, as well as making it more stealthy. Um, a, a new one that we've actually seen is uh, Lucy POS. It's a new version of um, a, a malware um, that has a few more tricks up its sleeve. Um, but really, all of these different um, um, malware families, they actually rely on uh, various techniques. And I'll go through a little bit of uh, more detail about that. So when we look at a point of sale app, um, system, uh, where we're going to find um, data, credit card data is on the network, um, in memory, as well as on disk. Um, in disk, um, it shouldn't be the case, but what we're actually finding is some of the point of sale applications will actually log credit card information um, in actual log files or um, in caches um, in other areas on the system. And hackers are, are aware of this, and so when they run their malware, that's probably the first thing they're going to do is they're going to scan disk for anything that looks like a credit card number. Um, another place is uh, data in transit. There was actually a payment provider that um, this actually happened to them. Um, although information was being encrypted between the actual retail store and then the payment processor, um, within their own network, they weren't encrypting that data. Um, so this is another thing that hackers are, are well versed in. Um, they know that uh, a lot of times um, retailers or uh, payment processors don't encrypt that data within their own network. So if they're able to compromise that and they can put a sniffer, um, they can easily um, grab that credit card data. And it's very easy to look for any sort of data stream that looks like a credit card. Um, and here's just an example of where I was able to actually um, capture data uh, between two systems uh, that wasn't encrypted. So it's a very simple process, and it's something that a lot of the malware is actually uh, utilizing. And then we have um, what most of these uh, malware is actually using. Um, it's RAM scraping. Um, so um, essentially how that works is a credit card gets swiped, um, the uh, credit card number gets loaded into the system, it gets put into memory before it's actually encrypted. Um, and uh, here's an example of how that process works. Um, the, the software actually looks for that process and then extracts anything that looks like a, a credit card number, um, writes it out to a file either on the system or um, a remote server that's been already compromised within the network, um, and then they're able to then exfiltrate that outside of the organization. So what happens here is though there's a lot of actual places where you can actually detect the change if you actually know what to look for. Um, with Tripwire, we actually provide uh, ways of actually detecting um, changes within an environment with Tripwire Enterprise. Um, you know, if uh, malware gets installed onto a uh, system, on a host system, um, not only do we detect that binary when it gets loaded, but any sort of, if, if that in, um, installer gets run, any sort of changes that happen on the system, be it, you know, a file change in the Windows directory, uh, registry changes, all that gets picked up. Um, and also, we now have some integrations with uh, various threat intelligence um, uh, providers. Um, 
such as uh, with Checkpoint um, and a few others, where we can actually send that binary off in real time to see if it's been seen before. So, you know, is this binary malicious? Is this a known um, point of, piece of point of sale malware, for example, or, um, or another um, maybe hacking tool? Um, and when that happens, you know, we'll send back and say, yes, this is a, a new threat that's been detected. Um, and through that, you can automatically update, you know, other, um, um, like your IDS systems to, to be aware of that. So if um, you ever see within your environment again, it would get blocked. And also, the, um, another way to do that is if uh, you do see uh, something that looks like a credit card um, that gets written out to a file, we can also help with that. So um, if, uh, you know, a, a log file or a new file gets created and credit card information starts being um, loaded into that file, that's something we would be able to detect, and you want to alert on that um, immediately. Um, if you ever see a credit card number on a system or um, that's uh, being transmitted across the network, um, you may want to detect that really quickly. Not necessarily, it may not be an attacker, but you know, even if uh, someone within your own organization is, is uh, writing down credit card numbers in a Word document and sending that out as an attachment or uh, writing that on any of the other systems, you're going to want to be alerted to that immediately because um, you, can, you can have some uh, serious repercussions as a result. So um, that's my end of the presentation here. Um, next, I'm going to be um, handing this um, off to uh, <clears throat> Randall with uh, RippleShot. Um, so I'm really uh, impressed with RippleShot's technology. I was I was really curious about how, like, uh, the Secret Service, for example, is able to identify uh, how breaches happen, um, even when the organization itself doesn't know. Um, and, um, and there's a lot of really cool things that happen on, on the big data side, um, how um, these organizations and fraud analysts can actually detect that. Um, and RippleShot's one of those providers. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it off to Randall and uh, take it away. Thanks, Ken. <clears throat> So Target is always a good place to start. They're almost legendary for their IT sophistication. <clears throat> but during last year's breach, they made a very small mistake. They ignored recently installed FireEye's warning of suspicious activity on their network. If Target had heard this message, absolutely no data would have been lost. In August of last year, the Payment Network told online retailer No More Rack that they might have a breach. They got Trustwave to do a PCI audit, which they passed. By January, unfortunately, they had to announce they were in fact breached. Sam and Ken and uh, Scott and Jeremy are really smart guys and, and people like them. If Target had listened to FireEye, for example, you know, cards would have been lost. But in the case of Trustway's help for Nomarack, that wasn't enough. There's a common saying in security, it's almost a Zen koan, that security professionals have to be right every single time. But fraudsters only have to get it right once. This is Sergey Tarasov, the developer of Black Paws that Ken was referring to earlier. Variants of his software has been responsible for Target, Home Depot, and a boatload of other breaches. But Black Paws was known for a long time to the uh, anti-malware software that was used, in fact, by Target. So hackers did a really simple but fairly brilliant thing. They randomly ch changed pieces of Black Paws, submitted it to Symantec and others. Symantec said, that's Black Paws. Mutate again, submit, that's black pause. Mutate a third time, you're clean. We can do, and we should do, everything we can to protect ourselves to prevent a breach in the first place. But the truth is, we will fail. Either the hackers bring something clever to the table, and they are very smart, or we drop the ball like Target did. Payment cards, uh, data breaches go undetected for on average 200 days. And rarely does the retailer detect their own breach. More often they get told about their breach from the payment network or from law enforcement. Or even worse, you find out from somebody like Brian Krebs, everybody we've talked to has the same thing to say. They feel 
scared in the dark, and unfortunately, the last ones to know about their own data breach. So what happens when you are breached? <clears throat> Mega retailer Target lost billions of dollars. They lost their C-suite. They lost a great deal of consumer trust. But the smaller retail retailers fare even worse. The Poneman Institute says that 60% of all small businesses will close within six months of a public data breach. Unfortunately, I can report that there are several more mega breaches uh, yet to be announced, and hundreds of smaller ones that may lurk undetected for months to even years. Every one of these undetected breaches will silently grow losses for everybody. And the public ones will often bankrupt retailers and certainly pummel consumer confidence in the payment network. So what do you do? As both Sam and Ken mentioned, there's no one universal solution. But RippleShot can be a, at least part of that answer. We're a cloud-based platform, and what we do is detect payment card data breaches quickly and reliably. RippleShot doesn't sit inside firewalls of merchants or banks. We don't look for malware or network intrusion, and we don't attest to PI compliance. You should get that help from the other speakers in today's talk. RippleShot takes a radically different approach. We realize that no matter how fraudsters harvested payment cards in the first place, in order to make a profit, they have to eventually use those cards. So we use payment card transactions only to detect payment card data breaches. We've identified, we generally identify thousands of compromised cards all at once, and we can find them weeks to months before the fraudsters have had a chance to spend them all. We knew about the Home Depot data breach, for example, four months before Brian Krebs broke the story. So how do we do this? We've partnered with a consortium of payment card issuers. As a result, RippleShot knows the complete purchasing history of tens of millions of accounts across the United States. When those issuers tell us about cards that have been used fraudulently, we immediately trace the purchasing history of those cards back in time to where they all shopped at the same location in this case, say, Target in Minneapolis. That's where the card information was stolen. The rest of the cards that visited that store are at high risk of being used fraudulently subsequently. And of course, now the retailer has a very serious problem that needs to be addressed immediately. If you look at, this is a fairly slippery concept, so I'm gonna come back to it in a slightly different way. If you look at cards going through any given merchant, about 2% of them will eventually be used fraudulently somewhere else. That's the background rate. And it's close to constant across many, many merchants. But if you, instead you see 5% or 10% or even more, then you can become more and more convinced that something is wrong at this particular time and place. Since we went live with our product in January, we detected thousands of breached store locations, which we've identified at the chain level, the store level, even to POS terminals, all with exact times and, and threat levels. We can show you which stores are breached and which ones most severely. Uh, this shows a regional retailer's stores colored according to the breach severity from clean green ones to severely compromised red ones. We even know where the frauds are, uh, the cards are eventually being used fraudulently. RippleShot uh, lives in the cloud, so we require no expensive infrastructure to set up. You just tell us your store IDs, and a few hours later you can begin to log on and monitor your stores proactively and vigilantly. 
used effectively, this information can decrease the number of cards that are lost to hackers, help preserve your brand reputation, and prevent the worst from happening. So that's what RippleShot does. We're the first alert warning when the fire has really bro broken out. We'll tell you soon enough to limit the damage. We think there are three important components to this toolkit. Uh, first, we're safe, and we're fast, and third, we're sensitive. So we're safe. Um, in particular, we get our results strictly from the transaction data from our issuer partners. So we never live inside anybody's network. It's not even possible for us to affect your infrastructure in any way. Second, we're pretty fast. The key to our ability to detect data breaches is data. And we sit on millions of transactions today cooperatively contributed to us by our card issuer partners. We're rapidly signing up new banks so that our data set becomes bigger. And in fact, when our data set grows four times larger, we'll be twice, fast, twice faster in detecting our breaches. This, so no matter how much data we have, it doesn't do you <coughs> any good if it's far away from your business. Luckily, our data set is fairly representative of the U.S. as a whole. This heat map shows you our transaction volume according to U.S. counties. If you can follow the URL at the bottom of the screen, you can see exactly how many transactions are in your immediate area. I think you'll find that we cover most businesses fairly well. Even better, we're growing pretty fast now. Issuers understand that sharing data results in uh, helping everybody but the fraudsters. So uh, they're quite cooperative in this. All right, those transaction volumes I hope are fairly uh, interesting looking, but let's see how this translates into real world performance. This is a table of 15 publicly acknowledged data breaches along with when they were announced publicly and when we detected them. We're pretty proud of these results, actually. On average, we're beating the public announcements by about four months. We've been talking to a lot of the big issuers, and we know that they beat public announcements generally by a couple of weeks at best. So RippleShot is still months better than them as well. Four months is like an incredibly amazing resource. As we put our hands in the, our product in the hands of more and more issuers and merchants, we think we're going to see a pretty dramatic reduction in card exposures. So those are the big breaches. On some levels, those are relatively easy since they're, they have such huge volumes that it's, they're easy to see. Brian Krebs, for example, just by looking at the underground forums is able to detect um, the biggest breaches. The, what about the little breaches, though? They're the ones that are most important to the small and medium businesses who have few resources to recover from the breach. We've done a study that shows that uh, most breaches, half of all cards belong to breaches that will never see the light of day. These hidden breaches, we like to call them the dark matter of data breaches. They're invisible to most of us, but they're profoundly shaping the payments industry. More importantly, they're extremely dangerous to you as a business. Since we went live, we've detected hundreds, of th hundreds to thousands of breach locations every single month. If you know about a breach early, you can stop it when few cards are at risk. You should imagine 
how much difference this will make in fines and legal costs and consumer reaction. So how does this pan out in the real world? Home Depot's data breach started, was announced excuse me, on September 2nd. The, and it started on April 1st. We detected it April 15th. That's after only 10% of the cards have been exposed and only 10% of the fraud uh, was realized by, the, by hackers. And unfortunately, uh, the Home Depot problem is quite severe. By our estimates for credit card transactions alone, the fraud losses are in excess of $2 billion so far. And they're not alone. This plot shows a couple of other breaches that have been going on for longer than Home Depot has so far. In fact, together they almost equal Home Depot in severity. They're not the longest running breaches we've seen, nor even the biggest, but they are two mega breaches that we've been watching very carefully now. So if you're a retailer, RippleShot wants to be here to have your back when the worst does happen. We're proactive, we're incredibly fast, and we can spot breaches that no one would be able to come to you before with. And we're pretty pleased to announce that we have just recently partnered with MasterCard for their Start Like program. We're the first U.S. company in that program. And we've started pilots with some of the biggest banks around the world. More and broader data means early, earlier detection for everybody. So as a retailer listening to the world around you, it should be clear that it's not a matter of if you're breached, it's really when. So give us a call and we'd be happy to change that equation for you. You won't be the last to know about what happens in your store. You can be the first one. Great. Well, thank you very much, Randall. That was great, really good stuff. Uh, you know, now we're going to go from a Ripple shot to Ripple effects. Um, you know, when there is a, a data breach like this and the credit cards do get out there, um, you know, the retailers themselves and the consumers aren't the only victims, um, but also um, other online stores and other uh, retailers, you know, they become victims as well uh, when those stolen credit cards get used um, on their websites to make transactions um, or, uh, you know, credit cards get created um, fraudulently. Um, and to talk about that is, um, is Scott Waddell here, the CTO of Iovation, um, another uh, technology I'm a huge fan of, uh, another guy, uh, group that um, uses uh, and leverages big data to help fight fraudsters. And uh, take it away, Scott. Thanks very much, Ken. Great, uh, great lead in there. So, you know, as the, as the story with RippleShot expressed, this is really about a defense in depth kind of set of solutions, right? The great presentations you're seeing here today really sum up some of the key layers that you should be thinking about. We learned a bit about how to secure your networks through segmentation and encryption and other tools, how to think about the kinds of malware and uh, uh, components of a fraudulent attack against infrastructure to try to steal the credit card data and payment credential information, uh, and then through RippleShot, how to, how to get some early warning into the insights that, uh, that the fraudster activities uh, convey so that you can understand what's happening within your own space. Iovation lives in a similar world where we are trying to help you understand what the reputation of end user devices look like. So let's set that in context. You think about identity verification solutions that might be involved in a retail transaction where you're bouncing off the, the payment data and the address and phone and all these other details to understand whether they match the payment data. Uh, a lot of retailers, uh, because of fraud problems, have moved to authentication solutions where they're actually requiring a persistent account with a login, and those authentications might add friction to the flow with an out-of-band password or knowledge-based authentication, which is becoming increasingly reviled in the 
industry, right? People can't remember what car they drove in 1978 all the time. Uh, more recently, risk-based authentication, or RBA, where you're trying to understand other risk factors associated at authentication time so that you can figure out whether to do step-up authentication. And Iovation plays in the device-based solutions space, where we're really trying to help you understand about uh, the reputation of the anonymous device being leveraged by the end user to originate transactions through your native applications on mobile or desktop or through your web uh, properties. So let's talk a little bit about what that looks like uh, under the hood. What's a device? It's really any device. If you think about your personal use of the Internet today, you know, all the, all the web and app-enabled things that, that you're touching on a day-to-day -day basis, if you really stop and think about that and count them up, you might be surprised by how many devices you're using to access online services. Not just the computer you use at home or at work, but smart TVs that are web-enabled, tablets and mobile devices, even gaming consoles and handheld gaming systems. We're seeing all of those uh, in our system today. Uh, and and often used for uh, fairly high risk financial transactions and, and retail transactions. So we need to understand how those are related to one another over time and across our consortium of subscribers. When you take a look at sort of the building blocks of our service, it starts with identification, recognition, right? Have I seen this device before at this particular retailer or bank or social network? Or has it been seen at any other subscriber to the iOvation shared device intelligence network? Finally, I want to understand not just how do I recognize it, but what it's related to, right? Can I build a social graph of the relationships between those devices so that through common account access across hundreds of different online businesses, I get visibility into how these devices are related and now I want to look for anomalies, right? Are they trying to evade recognition? Are they hiding their IP address coming through VPNs or proxies? Are they trying to mess with device properties so that they can uh, more easily blend into the noise of all the millions of transactions being processed by all of us every day? And then uh, at the end of all of those processes, I really want to understand whether this device or any of the devices in the network of devices to which it's related has participated in fraud or abuse that I care about in the past. That's really the power and the early warning that, that comes from uh, the system. Keying on a couple of themes from some of the earlier presentations, you know, it's important to remember that, that number one, security is a people problem. Right? The good news that I'm going to try to persuade you of today is that the solution is a people problem uh, as well. And if you think about um, uh, some analogies that maybe apply to everyday life, right? if you've gotten a, a speeding ticket in the last uh, 10, 20 years, you've probably had the, the pleasure of sitting through a defensive driving class. One of the key lessons that you take away from that kind of experience is you could be the best driver on the road, you know, the most cautious, uh, the most well-planned, but you can't really account for the behavior of other drivers, and uh, they may be engaging in risky activities that put you and your family at risk. Well, just like we talked about in the Ripple Shot presentation, the same goes for online retail, right? You might have the most secure infrastructure. You might be putting all the right layered defenses in place to make sure that your business is not going to to be uh, the CNN headline about a data breach, but somebody else somewhere will. And those compromised, con uh, compromised uh, payment credentials are going to be used at your site along with the hundreds of others in pretty short order. And so that's why being able to understand very early in the process what's going on is critical. If you think about where we touch end users through our customer services, we might be mixed into account creation for sites that require uh, persistent accounts at the login authentication uh, point. Uh, when people are logging in to update accounts, maybe update addresses or phone numbers, which fraudsters will often try to do to defeat uh, out-of-band authentication uh, solutions, uh, where they're depositing uh, funds uh, for peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking or payment solutions, and obviously at checkout, which is more traditional uh, retail integration point. 
And so if you think about the overall flow of the process that our customers uh, participate in, they're telling us millions of times a day about the transactions and the devices originating them that visit their sites and use their apps. And then asynchronously, they're letting us know what the outcomes of those transactions are. Did this turn into a credit card chargeback? Does it look like identity theft? And the nice thing about getting that outcome feedback is it's not just reliant on the intelligence they get from the iOvation system. It's actually aggregating the intelligence they're pulling in from all of their other fraud and security tools. So if they're seeing mismatches in the uh, uh, identity solutions that they're leveraging to understand that, hey, you know, these identity credentials don't match up with this payment card. We get that intelligence in our system, and it's now associated with the devices that are originating the transaction, and that persists. So the next time that device visits any retailer that's a, an Ivation customer, they're understanding, even before presentation of the credit card credentials, that this device has engaged in fraudulent behavior in the past, and they can either step up authentication or simply reject the transaction outright, maybe redirecting the fraudster to uh, someplace where they can do harm. So the ultimate outcome of the service is an understanding of whether or not the uh, retailer should uh, allow, review, or deny the transaction in flight. Let's look at a specific example that actually turned into a law enforcement support case. This one involved uh, fraudsters using stolen credentials from a Mac, a Windows laptop, and also a desktop Windows 7 box. We were able to help uh, our customers and law enforcement glue together the relationships between these devices because of what we'd seen across multiple retailers. Uh, credit issuers got into the mix, and by gluing all the data together across these disparate uh, businesses, we were able to identify quite a few retailers that had been impacted and turn what would have been a pretty localized uh, you know, credit card fraud case um, up in Washington State into something that crossed state lines and turned into a much larger case because of the understanding of relationships between devices in the business that ultimately led authorities to uh, a well-organized fraud ring. That's important to note too, right? The, the bad guys out there in the fraud space today are not just onesie twosie opportunists. Uh, these are businesses. They have, you know, call centers and data centers, and they're operating for a profit, and they're marketing in the stolen credentials that come from retail breaches and other sources. And so, you need to apply, uh, you know, as much rigor in your security and fraud mitigation processes as they are. In this case, uh, our customers ended up putting evidence on the affected devices, and through later behaviors from those devices, it helped expand the understanding of how that fraud was unfolding. To give you a sense of scale, uh, we've done about 15 billion reputation checks on consumer devices, more than 2 billion known devices in our shared database, uh, more than 20 million pieces of feedback from our customers telling us about frauds that have occurred, and now processing more than 12 million of those uh, checks per day to stop a little over 200,000 uh, incidents each and every day. So the fraudsters are very busy out there, uh, and, and these are not, you know, just to give you a sense of the, uh, the flow here, these are not, you know, hits on web pages, right? These are attempted transactions where you've actually got fraudsters trying to do things at sites that are coming up as high risk and, and ultimately being rejected by our customers. And using all those customers in concert to build out this intelligence network effectively means that you're adding about 3,000 fraud analysts to your team to really be able to look at the transactions at the end of the funnel and understand you know, the risks in addition to all those other layered security defenses you put in place. Fraudsters like to try to evade as well. And so uh, they might try to use proxies. They might disable JavaScript through uh, the browser. They might block device identification entirely through plugins like uh, Better Privacy or NoScript or uh, Tamper Monkey on Chrome, uh, Grease Monkey on Firefox, all these things that give you very low-level control of how web pages render. Uh, and they can manipulate device attributes pretty easily as well. So we look at countermeasures to those problems that really help us understand whether or not they're coming through a proxy. We try to pierce through web proxies where we can to understand the real IP address that the transaction originates from. Uh, we detect Tor users. Tor uh, has about a, a, a 30x higher 
risk associated with it um, than transactions coming from traditional residential broadband, for example. When people are trying to hide their locations to log into financial institutions or carry out retail transactions, that always uh, gives you higher risk indicators. Time zone mismatches, collecting the, the timestamp from the end user device and understanding whether that, that looks right based on where we see the IP coming from in these kinds of geolocation-based checks. Uh, also looking for whether or not the device data submitted looks manipulated, right? Some of those things are, are dead giveaways that there's some automation going on possibly from botnets and uh, other programmatic means of interacting with your services. We also this year rolled out a capability called multi-domain recognition where all of the infrastructure for collecting the device attributes used to recognize and re-identify these devices lives both in iOvation's uh, hosted cloud service and also at e each of our individual customers, so it makes it that much harder for subscribers, I'm sorry, for consumers or fraudsters uh, to evade the data collection that ultimately hinges uh, on this service. Uh, and then we do profiling so that even if we don't recognize the device as this is device 123 out there in the wild, we can understand how similar that device is to devices that have been tied to fraud and abuse in the past. All of that gets wrapped up in a rules engine that basically lets you understand evidence. That's the feedback from all of those customers about transaction outcomes. Geolocation, velocity, how quickly are these transactions unfolding both at my site and globally across the consortium of users. That's a key consideration, and next to evidence is the, the second most popular tool for catching fraudsters involved in identity theft and credit card breaches because as soon as they get those stolen credentials, they will go out and shotgun transactions at multiple sites to try to, to monetize the theft. Often, they'll do that in uh, very low volumes at individual victims, and that might fly under the radar if you're just monitoring velocities in your own service. But in aggregate, we might see that, hey, this device or this small collection of related devices are carrying out uh, tens or hundreds of transactions per minute or per hour, and that's not normal, right? That's going to that's gonna raise lots of flags, and all of our customers can immediately see that unfolding. Um, I'm not going to run through all of these just in the interest of time, but uh, another one that's very interesting are these age-based checks. What's the tenure of the relationship between the end user device and the account being accessed for retailers that require persistent accounts? Those kinds of checks can help you understand account takeover scenarios where maybe uh, a fraudster has gotten a hold of the password or other authentication credentials for the account and now uh, all the payment details might check out, but this looks like a suspicious device that's in, been involved in account takeover in the past. You know, we mentioned earlier that, uh, that fraud is a business, and, and the fraudsters are diversified in their business as well. So uh, a lot of times beyond the traditional retail data breaches that we've heard so much about this year in the news, they're really constantly out there mining for the kinds of personal data and credentials that can even let them open uh, credit uh, accounts. Uh, in addition to those they might be trying to steal access to elsewhere. So think about fraudsters that are uh, you know, leveraging synthetic identities on social networks, gaining trust of other consumers that ultimately may lead them to getting more identity information with which they can apply for credit as shown in step two of, uh, of this flow. Once they've got uh, credit, even if it's not a lot, they can shotgun out to retailers and buy goods. Those goods get delivered and sometimes uh, you you know, they're manipulating the delivery process in flight to have them delivered to um, a changed address. Uh, and ultimately, they get those goods and then convert that to cash through uh, online auctions and the like. We've got visibility into all of these different steps through uh, customers uh, in retail, in online shipping, in credit issuance, and social. Uh, and all of these companies are collaborating to try to give us as many touch points as possible to discover fraud in progress. So not just layered defenses in your own network and layered defenses in your own uh, payment processing and data security, but really thinking about what's the diversity of the intelligence that you're plugging into your security and fraud mitigation flow, and can you get help from uh, other businesses, other market verticals that you know, might not intuitively seem like they would be important to your uh, your business, but when you really look at the way that the fraudsters view the world, they can really help to, to work together with you. 
uh, shared intelligence across those industries is very powerful. So when we look at customers that, uh, that onboard with us and uh, look at how much fraud are they catching from just their own intelligence, it accounts for about 68% of the fraud catch. 68% is uh, the fraud they're catching just based on their own experience with the end users and those end user devices. When they add sharing to the mix and they start looking at the outcomes that they can leverage in real time from all of these other participants in the consortium, that adds about another third to the fraud catch, which is a huge uplift You know, when you're talking about uh, fraud mitigation teams that often get mired down in modeling where they're trying to eke out just a few basis points of additional uplift in catch without adding uh, a, a bunch of friction to good guys, that's tremendous. And that's really the, the core value that we bring to the table. The value of sharing uh, increases uh, in retail by about 3x when you're able to trust that uh, evidence placed by other clients by about 4x in financial institutions where we see lots of fraud in banking and online credit issuing. I think I may have gone, uh, okay. I think that's it for me. Great. Thanks, Scott. That was, that was great, great stuff. Uh, so uh, next we're going to be uh, moving on to Jeremy Henley here from ID Experts. Uh, sort of, so uh, if you weren't able to detect a breach um, and, you know, you do make the headlines, um, you do get on Krebs, um, or if the Secret Service does reach out to you to tell you you have been breached, um, you have a pretty big problem. Um, another company that's actually here uh, based in Portland is ID Experts, um, and they actually help a lot of corporations and organizations um, deal with the breach, uh, both before they happen as well as um, after the fact. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Jeremy. All right, thanks a lot. This is, uh, this is great. This is a ton of excellent information. And, um, you know, like it's been talked about, there's a number of different things you can do and, and ways to lower your risk and, and minimize the exposure. But as it's already been said, it's, um, it's not if but when. And, and these things are going to happen. It's just next to impossible to be perfect every single time. And so when that happens, a certain other set of software and services needs to come into play, and, and that's really where we start to step in here. And so just for kind of the context of, of what I'm talking about, um, I'm going to refer to this slide for a minute here where, you know, let's make sure we're all on the same page about what is a data breach. And depending on who you talk to, there's some different things that, um, you know, associations and ideas people get when you said, say, data breach or security incident or data incident and, and so on. And so for, from our perspective, we look at a data breach as something all incidents uh, happen, and some of them do not become a data breach. They're just a security incident. So, you know, to kind of use an analogy, you, your front door got kicked in, uh, but it doesn't mean they stepped inside. It doesn't mean they stole anything. It doesn't mean they even came in and looked. It's just someone's in, and, um, and they may not have done anything with it. A data breach, so that's a security incident. A data breach is when they do something with it, right? So there is actual disclosure and uh, or access or use um, or acquisition of sensitive data. And depending on what rules and regulations we're referring to, whether it's on PCI or PII or, or PHI, kind of changes the thresholds there a little bit. But, um, you know, for instances of, of this conversation, a breach is when they actually have the data now, and, and now we need to look through um, the process to determine what makes sense in terms of how to, to notify these folks because we, we actually have a data breach. And so before a breach occurs, some of the best things you can do as an organization, and some of these things are, have been touched on in different ways, but you know, kind of from a, a highest level, what we are looking for in an organization when they've called us because they have experienced a significant security incident and maybe they're trying to sort out whether it's a breach or not, uh, one of the most important things we're looking for initially is have you done a, a privacy and security assessment? And, and that's a very high level term. And so what do I mean by that? And, and what we are looking for is you know, have you done something to identify and inventory the data you're collecting? Um, you know, here we're talking a lot about credit card payment data and that is certainly a significant risk to the folks we likely have on the phone but many of you also have in your retail organizations a number of employees in places all across the state or 
uh, all across the union, as well as maybe even the globe. And so inventorying that data is going to help you do a couple things. Again, kind of at a very high level, when you collect it, it's going and look at it and evaluate it. You're going to be able to figure out what regulations you're exposed to, what federal regulations, what state, maybe what other countries' regulations you're now exposed to by collecting whichever data that might be. And so, you know, likely one in this scenario is going to be the PCI uh, payment card industry uh, regulations of rules. How you manage your data is, is kind of the second component, and this is where we really start to think about what are some of the things you do from a you know, physical, an administrative, and certainly a technical perspective to, to manage it and protect this data. And so it's important to, to really consider yourself as how do we deal with these things and have a good understanding of it because we see so many times where there's disconnects in, those, in one of those three areas where technically you were very secure, you had policies and procedures, they were intact and in place, but nobody locked the door, literally the front door, and someone can walk in and, and steal it somehow. Or it's one of these other areas where you thought policies and procedures were being implemented, but they actually weren't because you didn't go through and, and test it and assess that beforehand. And so it starts to lead to some of these other things that are the leaks that maybe um, other technology can detect, but ideally uh, you never have to even get to that point. The last one is, is who do you share your data with? And early on we talked about, um, about Target a little bit, and it was obviously someone that they had shared some of their system information with is what ultimately led to that compromise. And so it's important to think about who and what data uh, you share it with and understand how do they handle these things from a physical, technical, and administrative perspective, and what proof do they have to show you that they're being responsible and, and, uh, and treating it properly. And, and then last is one of those, one of those policies and procedures is going to be your incident response plan. And, and that's the document that gets triggered often, actually. If whenever there's an incident that needs to be reviewed, you want to follow that plan. And at some part of that plan, it begins to escalate to, uh, this is starting to look like a data breach, and it triggers another part of the plan. So you want to test that plan, and that can be um, you know, a, a, a half-day event where it's maybe taken several folks, several hours to organize it, come together in a room with your breach incident response team, run through a few scenarios, maybe pulling from recent events in the media and, and some things maybe some of your peers have experienced and designing a couple incidents that are very likely could happen and test it and see how your organization does and document that process and follow up and, and close those gaps. And, and then when you're we're finished with that, it's it's a good time to go back and start over and do all this again. And in part of that process, what you're creating now is a defensible strategy that shows that you're not bulletproof, but you are doing what is possible and within your means to be able to limit the risk of a breach happening. So maybe you've taken some of the things you see already on, on this session. You've also done these assessments. You've created an audit trail of some, to some extent to show that you're doing what you can to prevent these breaches from happening. That's going to go a long ways uh, to some extent with your customers, but an even farther extent with, um, with the regulators, um, with the payment card industry, and so on. So when a breach actually occurs, we talked about having a plan in place. This is you got to pull that plan out, and you you got to stick to it, and you got to use it. Oftentimes, that plan is gonna is going to bring trusted partners that you've already pre vetted and you know, bring them into where they're helping you respond to the the incident that has occurred. Part of that help is helping you determine whether it's an incident or is this actually in fact a data breach, and and uh, the speed at which you can do that the consistency at which you can do that and the, uh, the certainty that you can have uh, through that process all becomes very important in uh, you know, reporting back to interested parties, whether it's state, federal uh, agencies or the consumers who are potentially impacted by this. Then it, you want to, as you have kind of come to that conclusion that, you know what, we do have a notifiable data breach here, we're going to have to to respond, there's two parts of this, and and they often kind of get put in the same basket and not really split apart like they should, um, without proper um, group coming together to consult on on this piece of it. And it's the proportionate 
response and the compliant response. So the regulations often will dictate, here's what you have to do. And then there's the what's best practice, though, and what makes the most sense. And, and, and those things are not necessarily the same. It's, uh, they often will say, you need to notify the consumer, and you need to put a call center up for a period of time. And that's all you're really obligated to do. Maybe notify a couple of uh, state and federal agencies, but that's, that's it. It doesn't say you need to do credit monitoring, perhaps. And I'll come back to that because it's important here in just a second. But it's, it's important to have that kind of team meeting to really understand what has happened here and how are we going to tell everybody the bad news. The last line here is, is provide a proper level of, of concern and, and care to the consumer. And one thing that often gets forgotten, because it's kind of the last piece before you know, you've discovered something was wrong, you had to deal with all this bad news internally and, and deal with all the emotions and politics and, and finance of getting to, to the point of, of where you're notifying the consumer now, it's kind of the last thing that happens. It's one of the biggest and most important things, but there's often a tendency to have kind of a, a breach fatigue and get tired and, and not put all the right amount of effort and thought into that process. And what is important to understand is whether it's through email or through a letter, your customer is going to get something in the mail perhaps. They're going to open it, and it's going to be bad news to them. And, and a lot of them have gotten a letter like this before. A lot of them, you know, they're not going to have a, a big reaction to it, but, but some will, and an even smaller percentage are going to take it farther. And it's that smaller group there that we're most worried about when we come up with the best way to, uh, to resolve this issue with your customers. And so just kind of real quickly here, kind of wrapping up, the way we see the steps are um, from how you notify and deal with the breach is, is somewhere whether it's a technology like we've talked about earlier in the, in the session here or, or some other way, you discover that there's been a potential incident. And that's where the, the forensic folks will come in and determine whether or not we have a breach or not. Or maybe they'll certify the work that your own forensic team has done or augment that team. And eventually you get to a point where you can say, here's what happened, here's how it happened, and here's the specific data that was compromised in this particular event. At that point, we can move on to the next phase of your response, and that's, that's the analysis phase. And what's important in this phase is, is we're now taking this data and we're analyzing it against all the different state laws. So almost every state now has a notification law that might come into play or it might not. They are different. There's nuances. Some of them have uh, assessments and, and thresholds where it has to be met before you're required to notify, and others have a different set. Uh, in some cases, federal laws will apply. And so being able to quickly determine uh, and come up with a recommendation on what to do next or identify um, if you have a, a, um, a safe harbor is important here because it could change the effect of, of what happens next. So we actually have created some software that, that helps solve that problem where you can tell the software what happened and what data was compromised and what, uh, what regulations need to be considered, and within a few minutes it's going to tell you whether or not there are any triggers to, to safe harbor within any, any of these regu regulations or if you're obligated to notify and what those time frames are, what uh, customers, what agencies, and so on need to be notified and, and how that should be done. So that's, what's com that's what you have to do to comply. And this next one is the one that gets overlooked the most, and this is breaches from the small ones all the way up to some of the biggest retail breaches that we've discussed already today is the formulate phase. And that's where we start to fold in what's best practice, what's our, what are our obligations to comply, and, and what's the most efficient way to do this whole thing. And I can tell you with a lot of these large retail breaches, they've come out kind of shooting from the hip, and, and you've heard CEOs come out and say, everybody gets credit monitoring, we're going to take care of you on this. And I'll be the, maybe not the first one, but I'll be one of the ones that will say, that's not the right solution here. Uh, for a lot of retail breaches, the data that's being compromised, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to open a new line of credit that would affect your credit report. And it's also, um, therefore, not going to show up in a credit al monitoring alert if you are signed up to credit monitoring. So you know, a lot of these folks who have credit monitoring, uh, thanks to Target, aren't being notified of new lines of credit that are 
because of target. Maybe there are some other breaches they've been in, connected to, but it's not most likely because of the target breach, as an example. And so there's other solutions out there that are more cost effective, that are also not going to alert the consumer the wrong way, that their credit might be at risk. There are other risks, and those need to be dealt with, but there's different solutions. So you know, it, it's okay to, to not uh, <laughs> to not make the, the credit bureaus rich on uh, these large retail breaches when it's it's just an unnecessary service. It's kind of set the precedent, but it's not uh, what's required, number one, and uh, it's not the best solution, number two. So part of this process of formulating is coming up with that kind of detail with how you respond to these incidents when they happen. Um, and that flows through from the product that protects the individuals, the press release, maybe websites that you use to inform consumers of what's going on, maybe updates with what's happened over the time of the response, the letter that goes out to the individuals, and then everybody within an organization from the board level all the way down to uh, the folks that answer the c customer service line and making sure that messaging is accurate and uh, that it is consistent so that we don't create more issues for ourselves. So now we've got the, the conclusion of that phase, we've got this beautiful plan to, to handle this thing as best as we possibly can. What's important next is that you actually have the response, the respond or what I kind of refer to as the operational aspect of data breach response. And that's having the capability to quickly, efficiently, and consistently print a lot of notices and, and have tracking of where these things are going and whether they're delivered or not. Have enough call center agents ready to go and trained to answer the phone quickly, competently, and also be able to answer questions specific to the incident and not some other, you know, the monitoring product, let's say. Uh, they, they want questions answered on a lot of things. They're going to want questions answered about the incident, about potential account takeovers, about a product that you're offering, and, and maybe why not credit monitoring. And you want to have competent uh, call center agents ready to answer those questions. After that, it's not quite over yet. There's often investigations and they, or lawsuits, and these things go on for a considerable amount of time. And if you haven't set these systems up properly, it makes it a lot more difficult to defend yourself into the future and showing all the things you did, why those decisions were made, and why they were the right ones at that particular time. And so it's important to have a seamless operation from this discovery phase all the way through to where we're kind of cleaning up after we've notified and, and we've dealt with all the escalations, we've dealt with any potential litigation or investigation, and, and truly put that thing to bed. It's important to have uh, a seamless approach that incorporates uh, software solutions to simplify, because these are complex issues, and um, there's a number of different ways to do it. So Ken, with that, I, I think I'll uh, hand it back to you and maybe you can guide us through a few questions that the audience has. All right. Yes. Thank you, Jeremy. This is Kate. Um, we appreciate that. And yes, we're going to do a quick Q&A session. We have a few minutes. Ken will field your questions. Make sure you uh, click on the Q&A tab uh, if you have anything to ask our presenters. And I think Ken has a couple questions ready to go. Yeah. Uh, so uh, first question is for uh, Sam. You know, one uh, thing that we've run into with some of these breaches is that, you know, um, the breach occurs through a, uh, a trusted business partner. Either, you know, they're a victim of a phishing attack or, or something like that, and they're able to compromise credentials, or, um, you know, maybe even you have a malicious, uh, you know, employee that's within that organization that accesses the network. So, you know, when we ha we're dealing with remote access, you know, our how do we audit, um, you know, what um, what those folks are doing on our network? Um, you know, does NetOp, do you guys play in that space, or do you provide visibility into what those business partners would have access to? Um, <clears throat> it's a good question, and, and I think when it comes down to auditing, what NetOp recommends and what we do, I think, fairly well as an organization is enable institutions to log remote access events. And you know, the, the first step in this is, is to first identify and to scan your network and to make sure that you don't have um, additional open, open access points. So if you can mitigate the threats or, excuse me, reduce those, those threats, right? So you, you first got to make sure that you're turning off all the, the rogue um, RDP ports that are up on your network and make sure that you are you know, consolidating down to what we would recommend, a NetOp remote control tool. 
now once, once I know that the only way to get remote access into this device or into this network segment is using that tool, well now I can rely on the logs and I can rely on the information that's being captured to identify who did what and when. And we have customers um, that are using the, the logging of NetApp Remote Control not just in managing incidents or to do research in terms of who is accessing what, but it's also used um, to manage their consultant level access, right? So I have a lot of different outside vendors and a lot of different people that I'm going to invite into my network intentionally. Um, and I need to be able to track what they're doing. I may need to be able to track that for billing purposes or for security purposes. And having those log files, having access records, and being able to manage that user as they come in and as they leave, it really gives you that visibility that you need in terms of both security, but then as I said, for other reasons, you know, billing, um, managing, you know, vendor relationships, et cetera, et cetera. Great, thanks. Uh, another question uh, for uh, Randall is um, you would mentioned that you were able to get uh, pretty granular in terms of, of location of a store. Um, you know, uh, I was curious about, you know, if you have a big store and you have maybe hundreds of point of sale systems, is there a way to identify specifically what system um, may have been compromised if maybe it was only one or two um, systems? Yeah, <clears throat> we do have uh, terminal IDs for every transaction, and so we're able to roll up per terminal. Some institutions, of course, mask that um, multiple POS terminals uh, feed their data into a, something in the back office and it comes out just as a single POS. But where it's available, we're capable of doing that. Oh, great. Good. Um, and then uh, for Scott, I was curious about, um, you, you mentioned that there was, you know, the, the case in Washington. Um, you know, where do most of these fraudsters come from? Um, I was wondering, you know, are there challenges with maybe some of these fraud groups that are, you know, outside the U.S. with law enforcement? Um, you know, what are some of the challenges that you've seen uh, retailers face there? Yeah, certainly there's, there's a, a higher uh, fraud incidents sourced out of Russia and uh, Western Africa, um, but we do see quite a few cases where uh, the fraud is homegrown here in the U.S. That was the case in this uh, this Washington scenario. It was a more traditional uh, identity theft ring, you know, creating uh, fabricated IDs and other things as as part of their diversification. Um, and so there's less law enforcement involvement uh, when it goes international because the costs become high in terms of, of pursuing the folks uh, overseas. Um, but but what we see is sort of regional collaboration among businesses. So our Europe, European businesses uh, work closely with law enforcement in that region, and they may not reach across the pond when they see fraud originating from the U.S. and vice versa. Um, but the uh, the network effect still kicks in pretty strongly. Great, thank you. Um, and then, um, so Jeremy, I have a question. I was curious about you know how many orgs that you actually deal with um, actually have you know a solid incident response plan. It seems like. Uh, particularly in retail, they're, they're, these organizations are really taken by surprise, and they sort of, uh, you know, try to put ad, ad hoc plans together. Um, you know, maybe they fumble the initial communication out to the media. Um, you know, and I was also curious too: is do you see any sort of um, differences across um, different industries? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think, you know, at, over the last several years, there's been enough media attention to these issues that a, a lot of companies actually have a policy, a disaster recovery plan that they call their breach response plan. What the biggest issue is is they haven't put a lot of thought into it and they haven't tested it. And so what happens then is it's just it's it's a plan, but it's not a good one. It's not the right one and, and it leads to these things where um, you know it, it doesn't notify senior leadership soon enough or maybe it notifies them too soon and someone goes off and and gets in front of a camera and starts saying things that haven't been well thought out yet because none of that was in the plan, and those kinds of things should be. Um, you know, I think larger organizations sometimes have done a better job than medium and smaller organizations across industry. That's pretty consistent. Um, financial institutions, I think, have seemed to be a slightly more prepared and just have a better culture for security to begin with than maybe healthcare is probably the other end of that spectrum where they're still trying to sort a lot of those things out. Great. Great. And uh, yeah, I mean, one common theme I've seen, you know, basically throughout all the presentations, I mean, it was one reason I wanted to bring everyone together, was just, you know, the 
you know, I think retailers are sort of, uh, they feel like there's nothing they can do. Um, I think some of them have even given up. Um, but what I've found is that a lot of times there's, there's, it's the making sense of data, either, you know, data that needs to be collected within the organization or, you know, I think a lot of uh, retailers didn't realize that there was, you know, some of this uh, sort of big data around the car transactions um, that can be used for, you know, identifying where that breach happened, um, as well as, you know, you, being able to leverage that data to actually, you know, block some of those transactions transactions like we've seen with iOvation. So, um, you know, I, was, I just want to thank everyone here, uh, Randall, Scott, Jeremy, um, and Sam. Um, I think this was a really great presentation. Um, we're going to send out uh, a follow-up email to the participants here as well. Uh, we've also recorded this, uh, so, uh, you know, if, if folks missed it um, or if you want to share this with uh, other folks in your organization, um, you can go ahead and do that, and we'll also provide some additional resources. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Kate. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, you pretty much mentioned everything that I was going to say, uh, which is awesome. So I'll reiterate, we are sending out a link to the on-demand version of this webcast and the slides. Also, if you want to earn a CTE credit for attending the webcast today, we can certainly get that to you if you reply to the email that I send out. And we hope you did enjoy the presentations today. And if you'd look for future presentations on tripwire.com, and we have a wonderful blog called The State of Security. And again, all of our contact information for our speakers are on the bio widget you can check out. Thanks again for joining us today, and have a great day.